This is a good list that I've put together, inspired by a couple of others and my own contribution, and I'd like to share this list with you. First, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I take the Herbalife products. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health. It affects your future. It affects your psyche. So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes. If I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances. To rise above what happens, the petty little things, the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours. That would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you, and in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. The third on the list I had was enthusiasm. 
And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside, 90%, 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people, that kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm, a lot of it is quiet, a lot of it is unheard, and the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable is expertise. Wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be, in the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of organizing. If you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills, Herbalife has the way for you to invest those skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills. Here was the next one on my list, making a powerful contribution to you, the variable and that is preparation. Well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we finish two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time. And the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare, it takes time to get ready. And the decisions you make in the preparation time, those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're gonna put everything together. The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because this fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Every value in life must be paid for, and those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them, it's because it comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you got to go after them. You got to go to the class, you got to go to the workshop, you got to go to the training, go to the book. 
right? You got to go to the journal, right? Go where good ideas are being taught, go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not gonna be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well prepared. So, prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. I want to prepare myself this year for next year. Yes, I wish to be effective this year, but I'm also thinking of ways. How could I be better? How could my ideas be more powerful? How could they be sharper, more clear? How could I reach some people uh, next year that I perhaps can't reach this year? I haven't reached deep enough into my own soul to affect some people. Some people just pass by and say, hey, what a good speech. But how could I make it stronger than that, deeper than that, more powerful than that? I cannot be as powerful as I could be next year. You know, you can't go to the to the 10th grade and the 5th grade. You just got to go through the grades. But the more you are prepared, when the 10th grade finally comes, now you can cash in and get two times, three times, five times more value from it by being prepared. I want to do my best this year for Herbalife, but I also want to get ready for next year, 1999. And then when the year 2000 comes at the turn of the century, I want to be well equipped by language, by instinct, by temperament, by personality, by influence to really be valuable the year 2000, 2001, 2345. That's my goal. I'm sure it's your goal. Now here's the next one. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible and I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up, I can fill the gap, I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Here's the next key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day. It attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control, that are powerful, but they know how to use their power. Influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning, all of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self image that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You've got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself is the ultimate importance. That kind of image 
to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self-reliance. Now here's another one in my rather short list. The next word is character. Becoming a person of high values, a person of principles, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. It took character when Mark started to put the marketing system together. How can we have a system that will build in the integrity that people will know that if this happens, then this will happen. And if this goes wrong, here's the way to fix it. Unless you have the principles and the character and the integrity to put together a viable plan for a wide variety of people, then the system is not gonna last very long. And I've been around long enough, and I'm sure you have been around long enough to see a lot of systems that got started, but they failed. And the reason is because they were not constructed with integrity. They were not constructed with character. They were not constructed with doing the right thing. They might have been constructed to take advantage. You know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. When someone took advantage and didn't have the character, didn't have the principles, and didn't have the, uh, the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line, not to pass the line. When we come to an opportunity like Herbalife, especially uh, multi-level network marketing, it is so dynamic, it is so powerful, and it is so possible in fortune making that sometimes people wanna speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit, because then, you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Doing Herbalife right will build your fortune longer and stronger than trying to cut the corners and not doing it right. If, you'll ha if we'll have the integrity that Mark had when he started it and keep perpetuating that, that we will do the right thing by the marketing system, the right thing by uh, a distributor who has a customer and they take care of that customer, that customer belongs to that distributor, that kind of integrity in the marketing system, the kind of integrity we have among each other, the kind of character we have to rely on each other, because here's what we cannot do. We cannot do this by ourselves. Mark's got to count on me. I've got to count on Mark. We've got to count on the president's team. The president's team has to count on uh, the chairman's club for advice and counsel. Uh, we have to count on the millionaire team, the tabulator team, the world team. We've got to count on the distributor. We've got to count on the distributor giving the right message to the potential customer. We've got to count on the distributor giving wise counsel to the new recruit, teaching them the right way, the Herbalife way, the principled way, the character way. Vitally important. Building and developing your own character. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline, all of us have a challenge with that. Because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. But the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here, uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self-discipline to do their part, do their job. Here's one more, and that is the power of extraordinary performance 
and demanding of yourself excellent results. This is so important. If you want to live extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. If you want an extraordinary income, you must do extraordinary things. If you want an extraordinary fortune, you must go with the demands of what it takes to have that fortune. Mark has made such a fortune, it's almost beyond comprehension what the numbers really are. But guess what he has the satisfaction of knowing? He earned it all. If he'd have been lax in the performance, Herbalife would not be here these 18 years later. Herbalife would have been a footnote in multi-level history. But because he performed year after year, the third year and the fifth year, and the seventh year and the tenth year, and the twelfth year and the fifteenth year, and now performing well in the eighteenth year, I'm telling you, that's what makes it such a viable fortune for Mark personally, of course, because he did the job. If we would ask of ourselves that kind of performance, and you've got to ask it of yourself. You know, I can't ask it of you. I would try to inspire you. I would tr try my best to share with you what it might taste like, what it's like to finally make your fortune. It happened for me. But here's what you must do. You must demand it of yourself. Society does not demand that you not have a heart attack. But if you want to escape having a heart attack, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you take herbal life and improve your health. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning. Uh, but if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of 10 skills in order to ensure your own future and the future of your family. Society doesn't demand it, doesn't require it, it is not a law. But if you want the benefit, you must demand it of yourself. The key is time is precious. Now let me give you Bill Bailey's a description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. When my friend Mark died at age 44, someone says, that's young to die. But what if he lived four lifetimes in one? He might not be too young. Whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with. Experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. Here's one of the best ones we covered earlier. When should you start building this hotel? Answer as soon as you have it finished. Now jot this one down on time management. When should you start the day? as soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can, leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month till it's finished. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished to the best of your ability. It can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. And it might get all upset. It might get torn up and you do anew and you make so much progress the first 90 days that now you've got, you've multiplied it all by two by three. Because that happened to me. I thought, wow, here's how, this is gonna be a great year. By the time I'd finished the third month, I'm rolling, I'm soaring. 
so many things are happening, I revised my whole year's plan. Now, jot this down, approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one, step down to something easier. The guy's in sales and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Little girl says to her mother, daddy comes home, brings his briefcase and pats me on the head and says hello, disappears and works on his papers. How come my daddy doesn't play with me? And her mother said, look, your daddy loves you very much, but he has, he's so busy at work, he can't get it all done, he has to bring it home. He loves you, but that's why he can't play with you. And the little girl said, why don't they just put him in a slower group? Jot this down now. If you don't have time for your kids, you might consider joining a slower group. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny, but the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes? And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time, reasonable time. Now here's the ultimate in the management of time, and that is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get, you know, nine out of 10, eight out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get one out of 10. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock, so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now you're your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. Say, I'm gonna take charge of my health. One of my albums is entitled, Take Charge of Your Life. Take charge of your time, take charge of your resources, which we're gonna talk about next. Take charge of your health. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family. That's not a requirement of society, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. Society doesn't require that you build a financial wall around your family, nothing can get through. That's not a requirement of society. It's a requirement you impose on yourself to build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. So impose on yourself the self-development of being in charge, taking charge of your life and your health and your future and your responsibilities and all the rest. Next. Reasonable time is enough time to achieve all of your goals. Just jot that down. Reasonable time is enough time. Here's why. It's not the hours you put in, it's what you put in the hours. If you start depositing greater ideas into the hours you've got later, 
the now. I'm telling you later, you can't believe the productivity that will flow. The ideas you can't think of now, a year from now, they'll start to flow. And when you deposit those ideas in the hours you've got, productivity multiplies by two, three, five, ten. Next, time management essential. We've already covered the first one, a written set of goals. And then do priorities on your goals. What's important this week? What's important this month? Here's the next one. Often review. Just go over your goals to make sure that your list is working for you. It's got you inspired. It's got you turned on. Somebody says, how come you're up so early? Say, if you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. Well, if you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If it was going to stack up for you like it's stacking up for me, you'd be getting up early. Here's some more time management essentials. Learn to study what we call majors and minors. You pick up the phone. Here's what you must say when you pick up the phone. Is this a major conversation or a minor conversation? If it's minor, a few pleasantries and you're done. If it's major, maybe you've got to make a few notes. So here's the next one. Important conversations make an agenda before you make the call. Just jot down a little agenda. It's so easy now to just talk out of your head. Did you ever hear a conversation end like this, like this? Let's see, there was something else. See, you don't look that swift. I can't think of it right now. I'll call you back. See, you look a little incompetent. Let's see, there was something. It escapes me right now. Really? So have you got this now? Make an agenda before you make a call if it's an important call. Now, later, that saves you all kinds of stuff. You call John in, the salesman, say, John, remember those four things we went over? Said, no, we didn't talk about that. And then you pull out your daytime or whatever, and there's the list you made when you made the call. He said, oh, yes, seems like I do remember. Salespeople especially can talk you out of what's in your head. It's true. No, we didn't talk about that. And if you don't have a little proof, I'm telling you, it's gone. So make an agenda before you make a call. So what's major, what's minor? Now, here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? Here's minor time, thinking about prospects. Here's minor time, making lists of prospects. Here's minor time, keeping books on prospects. Here's minor time, going to see the prospect. Here's minor time, evaluating the prospect after you've been there. That's all minor time. Here's major time, in the presence of the prospect. And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. I mean, their progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Here's another one in sales we learned. Don't mistake courtesy for consent. If somebody's pleasant and they nod, you say, oh, they're going to buy. No, they're courteous. You can't mistake courtesy for consent. Now, here's a big one, concentration. I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found it turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Now, here's a big one on time management. 
When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach, I'm saying I should be at the office. I should be at the office. Now my family's upset because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. You don't want the reputation of being the office joker. Yes, there's time for some pleasant stories. Yes, there's time for a little humor. Yes, uh, best if it's a happy office, of course. But I'm telling you, you got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called. Serious business, not grim, not unhappy, but serious. Here's another key phrase. All work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to, to go, you got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion, a passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down, down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial, menial. No job is not, no, every job is noble. Training life for pay, making a contribution to society. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you should said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit over commit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. Next, analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key, get it covered. I used to keep promising myself, I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm gonna save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of the time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Next, beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication, especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. When it comes time to have dinner with your family, you shut off all systems. Unless the ones that can take messages silently. Don't let anybody intrude. Come through the front door nor the back door, nor through the telephone or any other device. So you can't reach John and his family when he's having dinner. The president of the United States couldn't get through. If you develop that kind of a reputation, father, mother, when we have dinner, when we're visiting and have this time with our family, nothing intrudes. So don't let these clever little devices keep intruding. You've got to have a place that's sacrosanct. It's, it's valuable. You don't let anything in for that period of time. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why. Time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn. You can't let someone steal your capital. And you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time. And some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour, and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front. 
helps you to get to the problem now. But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking. After you finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Next, learn to think on paper. Solving problems, take it out of your head and put it on paper. Another one is setting goals. Here's another good way to think on paper. It's a projects book. Each person you're working with and each project you're working on, get a loose leaf binder and a tab and some pieces of paper behind the tab and do a little continual summary of how it's going between you and that person and between you and that project. I call it a projects book. It is so useful to me. But what's going on between you and this person? When you last got together, what did you talk about? And you got a few notes there. Here's what we talked about the last time we got together. Now when you get together again, you can review that so you'll know better what to talk about. When the president gets ready to travel and he's going to meet some important people, guess what they bring him? All these briefing books. Right? The last time you were with Khrushchev, Kennedy is informed. Here's what he said and here's what you said. Kennedy said, oh, that's valuable. I need to remember that. If a person is important, it's worth a little running account. You might even have a project book for your children. Here's what's happening between me and my child. We've talked about this and we've talked about this and we've talked about this. Next, a day timer. Keeping track of all of your appointments, you know, Mine is all filled with, you know, when to catch an airplane and when to do a seminar, and when to sit down and have a conference, all the rest. Next is a game plan. You know, if you've got a house and the you know insurance is going to come due and some other things are going to come due, you just put it on a spreadsheet to make sure it's taken care of. Key phrase, take things out of your head and put them on paper. Now, here's the last one, thinking on paper, and that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now, my journal is not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impress me. Uh, today, I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Today, this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy, right? And just keep a journal, right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes, right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes. When you get back home, you put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. My journals all reserved privately for my children and my grandchildren. Can you imagine what I've collected over the years? It's unbelievable.